Good morning. Hello. Welcome to Case Western Reserve University School of Law. On behalf of the dean, the administration, the faculty, the staff, and the students, and everybody, welcome to Cleveland, Ohio. Um, my name is Michael Scharf. I'm the director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center. And every year we run a number of international law programs at the law school. I see so many familiar faces. I know that many of you have been coming year after year to these events, which grow and grow. Um, we have about 120 people in this room and another 100 upstairs in an overflow room, standing room only. And once again, we're very excited to have such a great turnout. This conference is being uh, live webcast, so all over the world there will probably be between 500 and 1,000 people tuning in and watching these proceedings, as well as the folks that are watching it remotely from upstairs. In addition, C-SPAN will be broadcasting our morning sessions, and WCPN will be broadcasting our noon debate. So there's a lot of media attention today. We're in for a very exciting day. Let me tell you how my involvement began and the topic of this conference. Two years ago, I was sitting in my office on the second floor of the law school, and I got a phone call. The surprisingly clear voice on the other end of the phone was very deep, sounded a little bit like Darth Vader from Star Wars calling. And he said, Michael Scharf, this is Greg Kehoe from the Regime Crimes Liaison Office in Baghdad. And, and I said, oh, it's a great surprise and honor to be called from Baghdad today, Greg. Uh, what can I do for you? And he says, well, we wondered if you'd be interested in helping us train and prepare the judges for the trial of the century, the trial of Saddam Hussein. And I said, well, wow, that's, that's quite an offer. But Greg, I, I don't know if you know that much about my background. Do you know that last month I just wrote an article in the International Bar Association News in which I said that the Iraqi High Tribunal would likely go down in history as being seen as a, a puppet tribunal of the United States and an illegitimate institution because it had been created by an occupying power and the judges were selected by an occupying government and they were being what looked like manipulated by puppet masters from your office. And he says, oh yes, we're familiar with that article. <laughs> and I said, well, Greg, do you know I wrote a previous article uh, suggesting that the entire invasion may have been unlawful? And, and he says, yes, yes, we know that about that one as well. <laughs> I said, well, why are you calling me? He says, we know that you and your office at CASE have been doing a lot of work training international judges around the world, that you have trained judges for the Rwanda Tribunal, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and that you and your students have been preparing memos for those tribunals, which we have found online and feel are very helpful. And we wondered if you wanted to get involved in this process. He says, look, Sharf, you can sit on the sidelines and hurl insults at us, or you can get involved and try to make this process a little bit more fair, a little more um, efficient, a little bit more effective. He says, if this really is going to be the trial of the century, don't you want to make sure it's a good one? And I said, well, I'm, I'm really tempted, but I'm afraid I might be co-opted by you. What happens if I go and I think the whole thing's a sham and I want to write about that? He says, Sharf, you can write anything you want. We're not going to pay you a salary. You're not, <laughs> you're not under any obligation. You don't have to sign any forms. Just come and help us out. So over the next several months, I ended up shuttling back and forth between secret locations in the United Kingdom, and I met many of the people in the room today that have been involved in these trials. And I found out that a lot of what I had written about and what I perceived about in the Iraqi High Tribunal was actually not correct. And one of the things that we've learned by watching the trial very closely and also um, talking to people that are in Baghdad is that the media exposure and coverage of this trial has been is really inadequate and misleading. And for that reason, the tribunal in the process has been snake bitten. And it may not be able to recover from that. But I think what one of the themes you may see today is that there are a lot of surprises about this tribunal. A lot of what you're going to learn today has not been public information. Those of you watching in a C-SPAN and around the world are going to find that there's a lot of new information about the tribunal. You might want to take a second look at this. Well, after we got involved in helping the Iraqi High Tribunal, my students have been writing memos. They're still doing so on major issues pending before the tribunal. We decided to create a blog, which is a website where we got a dozen experts, many of whom are in this room today, to contribute comments every time there was a major development on the trial. 
And this blog we have posted um, on the web. It gets about 1,000 visits a day. It's had 100,000 visits since it was created. It's the number one website in the world dealing with this trial. And it's been linked to and won four different uh, blog of the year awards. So we ended up taking the blog over the summer into a book. This is actually the first blog to book in international law. And my co-author, Greg McNeil, is somewhere in the audience today. He helped me out with a lot of the work here. Um, this book has the essays that were posted on the blog, as well as a lot of new material that we put in there. It's the first book out about the Saddam trial. It's already been selling very well, and you can get them in bookstores. But we are going to have some available for you um, behind this room during the breaks at a special discount. Um, it usually sells for $29.95 and you'll get it for $10 off. Those of you on C-SPAN, you can order it and get a 10% discount from Carolina Academic Press. Um, all right, enough commercial <laughs> advertisements. Um, in addition to all of this, we decided to have this conference. And we scheduled this conference for about a week before the verdict in the trial was to come down. And we got a lot of criticism. They said, why have a conference before the verdict? Why not wait till afterwards? And the answer is that this conference isn't about the judgment. It's not about the legal analysis of the judges. It's about the conduct of the trial. And this trial has gone down in history as probably the messiest trial of our time. It has totally eclipsed the O.J. Simpson case. It is up there probably in history with the Chicago 7 trial. Um, and, and people are going to want to know why was this trial so messy? What were the lessons we learned from this in terms of conducting other trials of leaders or defendants who are committed to trying to disrupt the proceedings? And so we didn't need to wait for the judgment to look at those issues, and those are the ones that we'll be dealing with today. I want to start by thanking the organizers and co-sponsors of this event. First of all, my program committee were a think tank of experts that helped me come up with the people to invite, and they include Michael Newton from Vanderbilt, who used to be the deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues, and he has been working behind the scenes in Baghdad in, in the United States to help with the tribunal uh, Michael is there. Okay. In addition, Mark Ellis, the um, director, executive director of the International Bar Association, who has been helping with his um, crew, uh, hundreds of lawyers, have been working under his leadership to help this tribunal and help this process. Mark is next to Michael. And then finally, Bill Shabis from the Irish Center for Human Rights. Um, he had an earlier conference this spring called The Verdict in the Milosevic Trial, which we co-sponsored, and he has co-sponsored this. And the two conferences really make a historic bookend of these two dictators that have been on trial, and Bill is right there. Um, in addition, I want to, of course, thank the staff of the Cox Center and the Centers of Excellence at this law school who make these programs work. And foremost would be Nancy Pratt, who many of you have met in the back of the room there, who is our coordinator of programming. Alice Simon, is she in the room um, outside? Alice, uh, if you're watching on the monitor, um, is the one that does all the publicity and makes sure that we can fill these rooms. And Don Richards, who is my personal assistant, is actually right now making a photocopy for something I wanted out. So she's working hard for us. Um, in addition, I want to thank the students of the Journal of International Law who will be publishing uh, this symposium issue. And every year we publish our symposiums issues in a, a very large volume that you can get, um, either single volume um, by ordering, and there's an order form, and this one I think is going to be outstanding. Um, we also have four organizations that are helping us out today. The American Society of International Law has made this a centennial regional meeting. The American branch of the International Law Association is making it a regional meeting. The International Bar Association, and finally, the International Association of Penal Law, which I serve as president of. And there are, if you're interested in becoming a member of this organization that focuses on this kind of issue, um, there will be forms which Don is now photocopying outside in a few minutes. And my first order of business is related to the International Association of Penal Law because we always begin these conferences by giving our Book of the Year Award. And this year, our Book of the Year Award goes for a wonderful book called Nowhere to Hide. There's a photo of the cover of the book. It's done by Michael Kelly. 
from Crichton, who came all the way here today from the West Coast to receive this honor. And Michael, if you'll come up, I'd like to present you your plaque for writing the book of the year for 2006. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in, in just a, a few minutes, I want to give you a tour to horizon of what you're going to see today. So I'm going to preview the conference with some slides in the background, and then we'll return to those during the actual conference. First of all, we're going to begin with a special dedication ceremony and a 15-minute speech by one of the most famous people in the field of international criminal law. Many of you know his works, his name, and you're excited to see him today, and that's Sharif Bassioni. And he has uh, dedicated and, and donated the archives of his commission of experts that investigated the crimes in the Yugoslavia to us, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Next, our keynote address this morning from 9 to 9.30 will be by the Honorable Samir Samadi, who is Iraq's ambassador to the United States. This is a special surprise. This is probably the reason we have so much media coverage today. Um, we had a lot of time last night to meet, and he's a wonderful person, a wonderful speaker. You'll like his British accent where he was educated. So um, that is something to look forward to. And he's going to be telling us, among other things, about how the Iraqi people have perceived the Iraqi High Tribunal and the role this tribunal has played in terms of the sectarian violence that is ongoing in Iraq. Next, our first panel is about preparing for the mother of all trials, a, a clause that, or a quote that Saddam Hussein may have used. We have a photo here of Saddam being lifted out of the spider hole and all of the documents that were seized that are now at issue in this trial. Following that, there's a panel on order in the courtroom, the challenges of trying a tyrant. Um, you'll see that this is one of the most difficult issues that this trial has brought up, but it's not the first time in history, and the panelists will give us some really exciting insights to, into that. We have a lunch debate about whether Saddam Hussein got a fair trial. Uh, you have a photo up here of the judge in the trial, and of course Saddam Hussein looking like he may not have been happy with the way the trial is going. Um, and this is actually part two of a debate that we had a year ago, also televised on C-SPAN, between myself and Curtis Dobler, one of Saddam Hussein's lawyers. That debate was, can Saddam get a fair trial? This debate will look at whether, in fact, he did. Panel three is Saddam on stage, assessing the media coverage of the trial. We have all sorts of media experts, including journalists and people who have appeared regularly on CNN court TV, radio, um, and so forth. Uh, and there's a photo of yours truly, I think, on C-SPAN talking about the Saddam trial as part of this misleading media coverage that we've all been exposed to. The fourth panel is a um, panel that's going to be in a very loose format with a lot of experts. It's going to be a crossfire exchange on whether or what are the lessons that we've learned from the Dujal trial. And then at the very end of the day, we're going to have a panel about, or actually a discussion about whether the Dajjal trial was one of the trials of the century. And this will be a little different. Instead of having any panelists, you all are the panelists. And it's going to be an open discussion with the audience. What do you think at the end of the day about the Dajjal trial? Was it among the, the most important trials of all time? So let me then begin now with the dedication of the uh, 780 Commission archives back to this photo, and tell you a little bit about Sharif Bassioni. In fact, you can, you can turn off the PowerPoint so that the people upstairs can actually see the um, speeches. Sharif Bassioni. I met him when I was at the State Department 14 years ago, working on issues related to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. And Sharif at that time had been known as an international criminal law expert who had written 100 books or so. He had done a lot of extradition law cases, many times on the opposite side of the State Department, which did not endear him to all of my colleagues. And he also was somebody who for 30 years had been clamoring for some pipe dream called an international criminal court. And he was maybe the loneliest but most forceful and persistent voice advocating for this new institution. Well, all of that changed in 2003 when genocide returned to Europe for the first time. And the United Nations needed to do something, but they weren't ready to create a new international trial like Nuremberg. And rather, what they did is they created a commission of experts to investigate 
the, the atrocities. And at first, many people thought that this was just going to be a paper commission that would do nothing more than look at some documents and wouldn't do anything particularly useful or harmful. And, and in fact, I think at the State Department and other governments, that was the intention. Little did they know that when you appoint someone like Sharif Bassioni to be the commissioner, that something like this will take a life of its own. And even though the United Nations refused to give him any money to do investigations, he went out and got his own money from the MacArthur Institution and other private do donors. He went out and got his own volunteers, an entire army of people that did interviews with victims of rape. And he was able to actually create a catalog of atrocities. His report that came out, the, the commission's report, was the first one to document the real widespread scale of the atrocities. It was the first one to say that genocide had been committed in Yugoslavia, in Bosnia. And it was the first one to suggest within the UN system that it was time to dust off the old Nuremberg precedent and create an international criminal tribunal. And so once you have a report like that, it takes on a life of its own. It creates a certain momentum. And one thing led to another, and a year later, we did create the first international trial since World War II, the first one in 55 years. And a year later, when the Rwanda genocide broke out, that would not have ended up in a trial if not for the fact that there had been the Yugoslavia Tribunal created because of Sharif Bassioni's efforts. And then later, a tribunal was created for Sierra Leone, and we have David Crane, the chief prosecutor of that tribunal, here with us today. And other tribunals were created for East Timor. And now there's a new one in Cambodia. In two weeks, I'm going to be heading out for Cambodia to do training for their judges and try to work with them so that they can avoid some of the problems that the Saddam trial faced. So Sharif Bassioni, at the end of this legacy, had to find a place to leave his documents, his archives. And it's a huge, tremendous amount of materials and photos. Many of the photos were so gory and graphic that no newspaper would publish them. But part of history means that they have to be somewhere. So he asked us at the end of last year's torture in the War on Terror conference whether case wanted to host these. And I got a grant from the Open Society Institute. We spent the summer digitizing, cataloging, binding these materials, and we now have them up in a special location in our library. And during the breaks of this conference, I'm going to invite you to come up and, and really see this very special war crime sanctum that the law school has created thanks to Sharif Bassioni's works. But I want to invite him to come up now to say a few words to us about his work and its relationship to the Iraqi High Tribunal. He'll be on several panels as well, so you'll be hearing a lot from Sharif. And I also have a special present to give to you. <laughs> Sharif Bassioni, this is a timepiece to make sure that you will have plenty of time to write many more books and contribute many more things to the field of international criminal law. It says, to M. Sharif Bassioni, in appreciation of your historic gift, the archives of the UN Commission of Experts for War Crimes in the Former Yugoslavia, dedicated on this October 6, 2006, at Case Western Reserve University. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank the law school, and thank you all for sharing in this occasion. Uh, I would like to first state that the reason why I uh, gave uh, these archives to uh, Case Western is, is a personal tribute to Michael uh, for the extraordinary work that he has been doing in the, uh, the field of international criminal justice. Um, and uh, also as, as a sign of, of recognition of his uh, leadership in uh, uh, what, what I referred to at a conference in Nuremberg last week as the uh, succeeding waves of combatants on the front of international criminal justice. And I think you fall in the third wave, Michael, along with a number of people here, there are some of us older folks who fall in the second wave, and we had the pleasure at the Nuremberg Conference to see a few survivors of the first wave. So history goes on. Um, but I would like to uh, bring to your attention that this week um, was, uh, is the 60th anniversary of the uh, judgment at Nuremberg. Um, 
and it's uh, uh, it, it's an, it's a good opportunity to to look at the way things have progressed historically. Uh, Sixty years ago, there's no doubt that the advent of Nuremberg, uh, its charter, uh, the establishment of the tribunal, the trials, and the judgments uh, were a true revolution in the world. It was, it was truly the triumph of justice and the rule of law over the rule of might. And uh, certainly Robert Jackson was uh, uh, the, the ideal person to represent the expectations of the world community in trying to develop a system of international criminal justice whereby uh, tyrants and uh, major uh, war criminals as those we saw and not only at Nuremberg, but at Tokyo and in the subsequent proceedings, would not be able to avoid their criminal responsibility. But it was not about vengeance. Uh, it was about establishing the rule of law. It was about establishing a record of these violations. And by implications, it was a, a way of instructing future generations of what had happened so that it would not happen again. Uh, it was a way of recording history, of memorialization, of education, and ultimately of prevention. Um, unfortunately, the goals of international criminal justice uh, have been met uh, with the opposing goals uh, of realpolitik uh, and the political interests of states. And as a result of that, uh, ever since the end of these two major uh, set of prosecutions in Nuremberg and Tokyo, but in the subsequent proceedings as well, uh, we soon find ourselves in <clears throat> 48 with the beginning of the Cold War. And as a result, the, the, the initial impulse that we hoped would have a continuum, uh, sort of almost stopped in their tracks. Uh, efforts at the United Nations level to codify the Nuremberg Principles, uh, the development of an international criminal code at the time called the Draft Code of Offenses Against the Peace and Security of Mankind, the establishment of an international criminal tribunal, all of that continued, but it continued only in a bureaucratic way, uh, the political will not only being absent, but the political will being contrary to the advancement of a system of international criminal justice that would not suffer the double standards of politics. And that continued for a fairly long period of time, and suddenly, as Mike was saying, uh, Europe, which had uh, uh, vowed never again, uh, and the rest of the world sort of chimed in and echoed in, uh, without really realizing that it's not enough to say the words, that you need a little more to do the deeds, uh, but the words were said, and uh, not much political commitment, institutional commitment, and financial commitment was there to, to back these words. Um, and Europe, which claimed to be superior in its uh, Western civilization than the rest of the world, had finally turned the corner uh, with World War II about atrocities. And lo and behold, we start seeing the same pictures we saw in World War II, and suddenly the myth of this uh, great Europe in which uh, civilization had surpassed everything else uh, had come to uh, a sharp halt. Um, the problem was, how does the world deal with it? Well, the world community, if I can use that term, and I use that term very advisedly because I'm not really sure there is something called the world community. Um, there is a community that meets in New York at the United Nations, uh, uh, so the fact that you have an assembly of people doesn't necessarily turn that assembly into a community uh, if for no other reason that we are not really sure that this group of nations all share the same values and the same interests. 
Uh, in any event, as, as a result of this situation, uh, something had to be done. Well, the obvious would have been, well, send peacekeeping forces. But, you know, that again requires the type of commitment we know doesn't exist. Well, something had to be done, and so the idea of a commission to investigate uh, was established. Um, to my great surprise, uh, the commission was established with what was the broadest mandate since Nuremberg, if you read the Resolution uh, 780, which was done at the State Department, and, and Mike had a hand at, uh, at drafting it. And, uh, as you know, uh, State Department drafted resolutions go through a lot of, uh, of, of changes and, and a lot of people have their say-so in it, but, but he had the uh, main task at, at, uh, at doing it. And uh, here we have this broad mandate to go and investigate war crimes while a war is going on. Um, and at our first meeting, my question of the Assistant Secretary General Deputy Legal Advisor was, um, w how are we going to do that? And he said, well, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. Uh, well, all right, um, next meeting comes, and well, what are your resources? Well, we have two offices for the Commission in Geneva, one for the chair and one for the staff person and the secretary. Well, where do we gather the material? Well, we haven't found the place for it. When do we go in the field? Well, you can't really go. There's a war going on. Well, do we have a staff to investigate? No, we don't have the resources. How much do we have in our budget? Well, you really don't have anything in your budget. <laughs> when do we get the budget? Well, next fiscal year. Uh, what do we do between now and next fiscal year? Well, talk to government, see if they can provide you with reports and information. Well, how can you criminally investigate by getting reports and information from governments that you can't document? Well, let's start with that. How about talking to NGOs and the media? And I said, well, that's not reliable information to use in court. Well, by the end of this long debate, I, I, I had done work with the UN, but I was still quite naive of its ways, and I certainly couldn't see through uh, the plan of this uh, uh, legal advisor. Um, and I... I came to the realization that, well, maybe there is a method to this madness. Maybe the method is you establish a commission, and the commission has a, a big mandate and a big name, and you make sure it doesn't do anything. And then at the same time, you have two distinguished uh, gentlemen, uh, Lord Owen, David Owen, and Cyrus Vance, whose task it is to negotiate peace. And in their mind, there, there was a conflict between negotiating peace and having a commission uh, that was going around investigating. And later on, I found out through a friend of mine who was then Assistant Secretary of State, uh, uh, he's from Chicago, and, and he told me that uh, at that time, uh, uh, David Owen uh, went to the Secretary General and, and used a, a, a Navy term. Uh, being a former uh, uh, special forces in the infantry, just the fact that it was a Navy turn already uh, turned me off. But uh, anyway, so he said, we don't want this commission to be a loose cannon on deck. Um, and so you better control this thing. And I, it, it took me some time to, to get over the idea of the deck and all of that. But <laughs> after a while, I realized that... But, perfectly understandable. I, we, we would eventually be going after somebody like Milosevic with whom he was negotiating. And he wanted to feel, make Milosevic feel good. In fact, he even at that time uh, arranged for uh, the president of France to receive Milosevic in the Elysee Palace with the red carpet and whatnot, just to build up his ego. Um, and, and it was quite understandable, because here you have people who are given the task of negotiating peace, and they really don't have too much. I mean, they don't have too much of a stick to make it work, and they don't have too much of a carrot. Uh, and so the last thing they want is a disincentive. Well, I mean, if they were smart, they would have realized that somebody responsible is going to do their job. They're going to gather the evidence. They're going to put it in the drawer. They're going to wait for the right time. They're not going to grandstand and you know, make, make, make uh, press conferences and, and denounce those leaders at the time when you need them to sign on the dotted line. 
Uh, but instead of trusting the good judgment of, uh, 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 of what I would say any responsible prosecutor does, does everything, uh, including in Springfield, um, I, I, uh, you know, I found that they decided instead, well, we'd better make sure that they're not going to do their job. Um, and so there was no money. As, as Mike said, I, uh, having only been a second lieutenant, I do not have a great strategic views as great generals do, and I, I always think of small things to do. So I said, well, how do I end run the system? And uh, I end run the system by establishing a database at DePaul University. The university gave me a whole floor. I enlisted student volunteers and young lawyers and had a total of about 144 volunteers over two years. Uh, we had an operation that worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We inputted data from all over the world. Uh, we documented the data. In the end, we assembled uh, about uh, 70,000 documents, which uh, we classified and cross-referenced. Many of these documents had multiple purposes. They dealt with multiple incidents, so it was not just one incident. About 300 hours of videotapes and over 3,000 pictures. We conducted 35 field missions. Again, using that uh, uh, small thinking of the second lieutenant, I sliced up every mission into uh, an identifiable mission of a period of time. So I could go to a government and say, uh, you know, I need a mission for two months. Would you second to me 35 uh, uh, soldiers and officers of the Corps of Engineers, 10 prosecutors, etc.? And that way, we had identifiable missions for short periods of time. Governments could second people to us. Um, we identified 151 mass graves, uh, a number of uh, facilities uh, where people were detained, tortured, and killed, uh, 3,000 towns and villages which were ethnically cleansed. Um, I personally conducted the rape investigation. I interviewed 223 victims. We obtained the affidavits of 575 women who have been raped and who identified their uh, perpetrators. Um, and and uh, the evidence was so overwhelming at the end of two years uh, that when we deposited our report, which was the biggest report in the history of the Security Council, 3,500 pages, uh, uh, the Security Council felt that it had no choice but to establish the tribunal. And as, as Mike said, it sort of broke the psychological barrier that had been established there as a result of the Cold War, and immediately the same plan was followed with respect to Rwanda, and things have developed. But uh, let me caution you. Uh, this is not uh, This is not something that we have to take for granted. This is a very cautious, tentative beginning. Uh, Realpolitik will always stand in the way, uh, as, as David Crane will tell you and, and others, uh, the problems will always be there, resources will always lack, political commitment will always lack, political interests will always interfere. Uh, David will tell you how difficult it was to get uh, Charles Taylor out of Nigeria for a long period of time. The UN was even willing at the beginning and in writing to give him immunity. Uh, and so the battle with realpolitik is still very real, very ongoing, uh, and uh, we have to be very vigilant. And so when you look at some of the problems that we encounter in these various tribunals, look at them not with an eye for cynicism or not with an eye for disappointment, but uh, with an eye to learning, uh, learning how these hurdles are placed in our way, what we can do to overcome them, uh, and maybe redouble your sense of commitment and perseverance. The difficulties are there, but the need for international criminal justice is also there. Thank you very much. I've, I've asked Sharif to introduce his long 
time and good friend, the ambassador from Iraq. But before he does, I was remiss. There are four people I want to introduce to you who spent the entire summer working on this project to digitize and catalog the voluminous materials that Sharif was just describing. And they're here today. Um, it's Cheryl Lewis from the library. Can you just raise your hand? And Deb Dennison from the library. And also uh, Sean Stevens and Alex Layton, two students who worked all summer long tirelessly on this. Are you here, the two of you? You're hiding somewhere. There's Sean and there's... All right, well, thank you all. And now if you would do the honors. Sure. Well, thank you all for having done this work. Thank you. It's my great pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce the uh, distinguished uh, ambassador of the uh, Republic uh, uh, of Iraq to the United States. Ambassador uh, Samir Sumaydai um, uh, served in, in many capacities in the post-Saddam, post-Bashist uh, change uh, in his country. Um, he, uh, he left his country as a result of the uh, Ba'ath regime and lived as an expatriate, uh, mostly in England, uh, though also in China for a number of years where he married his wife. Um, and uh, spent most of his expatriate career as a businessman. Um, he, by background, is, is, uh, is, is a Sunni from the Anbar region. Uh, and uh, if I am not mistaken, uh, his family comes from Haditha originally, um, a town which we should always remember for the terrible tragedies committed uh, by uh, U.S. soldiers who... Uh, uh, violated uh, not only uh, international law but U.S. law in, in committing terrible crimes against civilian population there. Um, Ambassador Sumaydai returned to, uh, to Iraq uh, uh, shortly after um, the coalition forces took control of the country. Uh, he served as a member of the governing council appointed by Ambassador Paul Bremer. Uh, continued to serve in this capacity and then during the transition uh, between uh, that, the governing council and the uh, first cabinet uh, of President Alawi, he uh, served as uh, Minister of Interior. Uh, he uh, then uh, was appointed to uh, the position of uh, permanent representative uh, of Iraq to the United Nations. Uh, and from there, he uh, took his uh, position as uh, ambassador to the United States. <laughs> uh, it is a great privilege to have him uh, join us here on that occasion. And of course, since the first statute establishing the tribunal, which was called the IST, uh, was approved by the governing council, uh, though I, I have to say that I'm not really sure that all the members of the governing council uh, studied the nature of the statute very carefully. Uh, whose history went through uh, a lot of changes uh, from the pre-invasion days uh, at the time when uh, I was a member of uh, the State Department's Future of Iraq project and uh, drafted the first statute for that tribunal. Um, and uh, you, by the way, the uh, r report of the Working Group on Justice of the Future of Iraq uh, project has been declassified by the State Department, and you can uh, download it. And it's a fascinating uh, uh, several hundred pages of work by a group of 41 uh, distinguished Iraqi jurists who evaluated what needed to be done uh, at the time. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, the statute uh, was approved as the IST. Um, I uh, worked hard at trying to have it amended. Uh, it was amended, but it didn't cure many of the legal defects that I had identified in it. But the issues of legitimacy have long passed, and the tribunal is well on its way. So now to give us an insightful look into the tribunal and its birth, and as the program labels it, an insider's look, we have the great privilege of having Ambassador Sumaydai. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's an honor to stand here uh, amongst such a distinguished group uh, to talk about the tribunal in Iraq. 
In fact, I was surprised to be invited because this is a panel of experts at a law school. I am not a lawyer and I am not an expert. So to start with, I was daunted by this challenge. The best I can do is to try and give a perspective from an Iraqi point of view. How Iraqis look at this process, how Iraqis perceive this tribunal, how they feel about it, and do they recognize it as justice for the tyrant that dominated their lives for decades. To put this in context properly, I'd like to take a historical perspective of Iraq. Many people think Iraq is a backward country, lawless, and totally without any sense of um, legal propriety. Let's just remember that the first ever written law was actually promulgated in Iraq. And let's also remember that for many, many years, the rest of the world learned about how laws can be written because it was in Iraq that writing itself was invented. To bring this a little more into the recent times, when the Ottoman Empire was crumbling in its last death throes, there was a movement which was called the Constitutional Movement. It was an attempt to give legitimacy to the sultans by creating a constitution, by binding the sultan by a constitution. It was too little too late, but not before it inspired a group of Iraqis in Baghdad to demand that their first government to be installed by the British should be bound by a constitution. And there was the constitutional movement in Baghdad, which petitioned many people outside Iraq, including President Wilson of the United States, who was considered by Iraqis to be a, a supporter of democracy worldwide. In Iraq, the first woman lawyer was graduated in 1935, ahead of all our neighbors. It was at a time when some of our neighbors did not even have primary school schooling for, for girls. And in Iraq was the first judge to be appointed in the region. In 1948, when the Bill of Human Rights was being debated at the United Nations. It was the Iraqi delegate who held out for gender equality to be enshrined in the Bill of Human Rights, not the United States delegate. So we do have a tradition of, of law and respect for the rule of law and um, a tradition for binding the ruler by a constitution and a law. However, Saddam reversed all that, and during Saddam's time, there was a regression in Iraq on all levels. What we witness really throughout the region and possibly internationally is a monumental struggle between the concept of rule of law and the concept of absolute power. And this struggle takes many forms, and it obviously is not resolved. In Iraq, Saddam took us violently and uh, determinedly backward, where he established absolute power, and the country uh, moved back socially, politically, economically, culturally, on every front, the country went back. He drove Iraq back into the days of darkness of the Middle Ages. 
people who were educated, who did not um, ascribe to, to, these, to, to, to his ways, were either murdered or they left the country. Many Iraqis live outside Iraq, have lived outside Iraq for, uh, for decades now because of that. So now, the time of reckoning. When Saddam was removed, there were great revelations. Mas In fact, even the people who were most active in opposition, including myself, during Saddam's re regime, never realized how terrible the crimes which were committed were. The scale of the atrocities uh, was revealed only after uh, Saddam was removed. Al although we all knew about Halabcha, we knew about Amphal, we knew about mass killings, but we never imagined the, the gigantic scale that, that uh, these uh, crimes uh, took. Now we have plenty of evidence, we have mountains of evidence, and we have hundreds of thousands of victims yearning for justice. The regime, however, having been removed, was not entirely defeated. You can say that much of the violence that takes place today is really the regime fighting back. Because all that happened, that it went underground, and with the determination to seize power again, it kept fighting. It forged alliances with outside powers, such as the Qaeda and religious extremists, and waged war on new Iraq. And we are fighting this war. So in the midst of war, we need to bring justice. This is the particularly daunting challenge that we face. Yet, we have to be judged by the international community on aspects of etiquette, aspects of propriety that, uh, uh, that prevail perhaps in the most stable uh, nations of the world. There is a need for justice, that's clear. There is natural justice. People feel in their bones that these wrongs must be remedied. If not remedied, somebody must be accountable for them. But we have to avoid mob justice. We have, it ha, justice has to be seen to be done properly and by people who are looking at the law dispassionately. We also have to avoid political expediency. The real politic that Dr. Bassouni mentioned is everywhere, even, even after uh, we start a, a, a tribunal like Saddam, even inside Iraq. Some people want to speed things up, some people want to slow things down, and for political reasons. We have to avoid that. And we have to demonstrate to the world that this new justice is based on the new values of Iraq. We do not want to use the values of Saddam Hussein to try him, because he would have been long gone had we done that. And we also, in order to be credible, have to incorporate the international principles which are accepted throughout the world. The tribunal to try Saddam are extremely significant. They are the first in the Middle East setting a pre precedent, telling the world that a, 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 a dictator, a ruler, ultimately has to account for his ex actions and decisions. That no one is beyond the law. This is a very new idea in the region. And in fact, an idea that frightens many people, not surprisingly. But 
I, I believe that it's an idea whose time has come. As I said, there is a struggle between the two cultures, the culture of despotism, the culture of authoritarianism, and the culture of the rule of law. Unquestioned, unaccountable authority still dominates throughout our region. The rule of law and the idea that people have to be held accountable no matter how high in authority they are is yet to take roots. And we hope that this trial will help create this mindset. In, bring, in, in, in putting this, this uh, tribunal together, we had really, at the beginning, quite a rough time. We had this first draft presented to us. I was a member of the governing council when, when the draft was presented. And uh, in fact, uh, I can assure you that I, for one, did read it. Um, and we pondered. We are not experts. We wanted something to, to look good, to be really good. And we all thought, maybe this is not perfect, but it's a good first step. Let's move on this. And we took that step. Immediately, people raised questions about legitimacy, how uh, a tribunal like this uh, can be legitimate when it is set, set up under the umbrella of an occupier. I reject that. First, because even the governing council, whose legitimacy was questioned at the time, as time proved later, Practically everybody on the, legitimate, on, on the governing council was actually voted in by the people and formed the Iraqi government that subsequently uh, took over power. And the people in power now are more or less the same people as those who were sitting on the governing council. Name all of them. They were there. So the question of legitimacy was, in my opinion, bogus. International control. Some people wanted us to have a tribunal under the United Nations. We didn't want that. We want to have our own tribunal. We have enough traditions in the country to create a, syst to, uh, to cre to create a system of justice capable of handling this. We wanted, uh, of course, help from the international community. And there was a third uh, a third stick used against us, which was the death penalty. The death sentence is still on the Iraqi statutes, as it is in Texas or some, <laughs> other, some other countries. And the debate goes on as to whether it should be abolished, when it should be abolished. However, Iraq is not yet at the point of wanting to abolish it, and that's our choice. That's the, the sovereign choice of the people of Iraq, as it is the sovereign choice of the people of many nations. And maybe the time will come when it is. But as of now, Iraqi people feel that that's the law of the land, and that has to be respected. So we do not ex accept any challenges to the legitimacy of pro or propriety of um, of this tribunal. And people continue to nitpick. This makes Iraqis, frankly, frustrated and angry. We must not mistake the trappings of justice for justice itself. Justice has to be sought. The trappings of justice are nice, and we have to observe uh, some of them. But we have to be always seeking redress, seeking justice as a high value because of so many 
reasons, primarily the victims, and ultimately, um, as Dr. Bessioni mentioned, prevention for the future, the never again idea. What we have started <coughs> in Iraq is a process. Maybe it's not perfect, but it moves on. And as we move on, we learn. And as we learn, we get better uh, at this. We have, we have really uh, achieved, by, by going through these reiterations, a, a road map for repairing the legal system in Iraq. The, uh, uh, the tribunal, although set up as separate from the rest of the judicial system in Iraq, it has to be integrated with it. We have to borrow from the international code, and in fact, a lot of the uh, ICC language has been incorporated into the Iraqi uh, tribunal. We have to link it, however, to our own legal system and the definition of crimes in our, uh, in our own statutes. And it will take a while by the time parliament works through all these laws and rationalize them and integrate them and make them whole and make them consistent. This is a process that cannot overnight, just because Saddam was removed, suddenly the next morning we have a perfect system of justice. We have to realize and the world community has to realize that this is a process that we are moving forward on and we need help with. We we have to reverse the traditions that were set up by Saddam. The independence of the judiciary, which was gaining momentum prior to Saddam, was brought under the thumb of the Ba'ath Party during his rule. And many of our judges got used to the idea that they receive instructions on the sentence from high above. We have to retrain our judges, although many of them are, are of high caliber and are well trained. But nevertheless, it, it takes time to get rid of this culture of linkage between the executive and, uh, and the judiciary. I think as, as a good step to re-establish our link with the international system of justice, especially on war crimes. It is my personal opinion that Iraq should ratify the ICC. That would give the right message externally and internally. We should upgrade and make consistent, as I said, the definition of crimes, and particularly on torture and rape. Women have been, were mistreated under Saddam. For the first time ever in Iraq, rape was used as a political tool of intimidation. There were people whose job description was rapist. Imagine that. On his ID card, it would say security rapist. And that was Saddam. A woman took the brunt of that. And it is absolutely imperative that new Iraq never again sees this. We want a system of justice <coughs> that dignifies and honors victims, that recognizes the suffering, and that puts their rights at least at an equal level to the rights of the perpetrators. We sense from Iraq that people outside Iraq are concerned all the time with the rights of Saddam Hussein and his henchmen. 
Of course, we do not want to deny them any of their rights. But it offends us when the victims are forgotten about or when the victims are relegated to a secondary uh, level of attention. It is important for us in order to heal our country, to demonstrate to the world that the justice that we bring is not a justice of vengeance. It's the justice of putting right what was wrong. That is really what we want. We appreciate help and guidance and support from the international community, and indeed we need it. But, the end, but at the end of the day, it is right that we do it our own way. Thank you very much. If you want to ask any questions, please go. Well, the ambassador will be around during the breaks if you have questions for him. Um, I probably should have put in a Q&A period because he, I'm sure, is fascinating during question and answer. But we'd like to take this 15-minute break now, reconvene at 10 minutes of directly. And those of you who want to take the first of four tours, um, there will be two groups leaving right outside the moot courtroom, and we're going to be going up to the library to see the new archives.